Hello and welcome to Literary Bar. It's been a really tough week, so I'm especially thrilled to be with you today. We've had our protest, but our struggle continues. I hope that we'll continue on a path of dialogue to achieve peace. In the bar today, I have an exceptionally passionate guest that you would love to meet. Do stick around and grab your tea or that glass of wine. And let's get lit. My book pick for today is coming all the way from South Africa. Kafia Boy, written by Mark Matabane in 1986, and it was published by Free Press. This book is an autobiography that deals with the account of a black youth coming of age in apartheid South Africa. The struggles of a life weighed down by the weight of humiliation at the hands of white apartheid masters and the draconian rules of the day. But it also tells of kindness and generosity from decent white men who supported the author to find his American dream through a tennis scholarship. This book, however, is also an ode to the tenacious love of a mother and the sacrifice for her children. So to honor the beautiful, hardworking women of South Africa on their annual Women's Day celebration, I will highlight the struggles that led to the commemoration of this day for women of South Africa. On the 9th of August, 1956, more than 20,000 South African women of all races staged a protest against the stifling pass laws of their union at their union building led by Lillian Ngoi, Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa, and Sophia Williams. This year marks the 68th anniversary of that struggle. Typically, when we talk about the struggles, we remember the icons of the day, Miriam Makeba, Winnie Mandela, Albertina Sisulu, Brenda Farsi, to name just a few. But there are other unsung female heroines of the struggle who fought to protect and provide for their children. People like Magdalene Matabane, Mike's mother. When we come back after this short break, we will delve into the book proper. Do stick around and I'll get my cup of tea. In Kafia Boy, Matabani narrates the struggle of being born black to a poor and disadvantaged South African parents in apartheid era. When poverty strips Jackson Matabani, his father, of his dignity, his impotence finds solace in alcohol and gambling. Domestic violence is unleashed on Magdalene, Mag's mother, as his father struggles to assert his waning authority over her to elicit respect from, the, from his scared and confused children. The nightmarish condition of living in abject poverty inspired Magdalene Matabane to dream of a better life for her kids through education. Kicking and screaming, she dragged Mark to school where he excelled. However, to support her family, she needed to get a pass. The pass law was an internal passport system designed to restrict movement of black men within apartheid South Africa. In the 1950s, it was expanded to include women. The pass law affected their ability to earn and support their families. Women were subjected to all sorts of indignities when their past elapsed, raped, tortured, and extorted. Mrs. Matabane experienced several degrees of indignities that was detailed by Mark in this captivating memoir. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, I'll read a little excerpt that captures the entire struggle of Magdalene Matabane, the woman that I celebrate today. Okay, like I promised, I'm going to read a short excerpt from this book that details how the mother went out of her way to convince Mark that education was the only way out. Why do you want me to go to school, Mama? I asked, hoping that she might somehow clear up some of the confusion that was building in my mind. I want you to have a future child, my mother said. And contrary to what your father says, school is the only means to a future I don't want you growing up to be like your father. Your father didn't go to school. He didn't learn how to read and write. Therefore, he can't find a decent job. Why didn't he go to school? He refused to go to school because his father led him to believe that an education was a tool through which white men were going to take things away from him. 
like they did black people in the old days. If you can read and write, you'll be better off than those of us who can't read. But I want things to be different for you, child. For you and your brothers and sisters, I want you to go to school because I believe that, it, because I believe that an education is the key you would need to open a new world and a new life for yourself, a world and life different from that of your father and mine. His mom did not have the opportunity to get an education, but she saw that the people who even had a primary school education, who could read and write, could perform better in the white man's world. And when she started to dream for her child from the rubbish dump that was her life under the nightmarish conditions, she realized that if only I could read, I would be able to get my own pass. And then I would be able to get better jobs in the white man's world. And at the age of seven, she tied Mark with her mother, his grandmother, and they dragged Mark to school. And it was in Mark going to school that the family had the opportunity to break out from the difficulties that they experienced under apartheid. And it was through his education that Mark eventually met the white men who he credits with being able to support him as he got involved in tennis. So it was in playing tennis that he was that he saw opportunities through scholarship, through the people that encouraged him to participate in tournaments and eventually referred him to schools in America that gave him the opportunity to cross over and leave the nightmarish conditions that he found in South Africa. And even though the past law, the struggle had continued even then, all this was happening between the 70s and the 80s because Mark was born in, 19, in 1960. He still suffered under the weight of the humiliation of seeing his mother beaten, his father locked up because they did not have the past. Some of the highlights of this book is when he met Arthur Ashe, the most famous black American tennis player. And Arthur Ashe came to South Africa to play tennis, regardless of the apartheid rules that did not allow blacks and whites to mingle. So apartheid really means apartness. You separate people, you segregate people. Blacks were lower, way lower than the white people. How do you come into somebody's land and tell them where they can go and where they cannot go? But this is what happened when the white explorers came to South Africa and created this, this rule of apartheid that separated the people from opportunities in their country so that they could just exist purely for the benefit of the white people. They were allowed to have as many children as they could so that the white people would continue to have people that would serve them. And it's for this reason people like Mandela, the ANC was formed and they fought tooth and nail to have a free South Africa. But the women said no, we needed that opportunity so that our young, our women can go out and support the families when there were so many raids that took away the husbands from the families and the mothers had to go to work. How would they work if they did not have the pass, the internal passport to go about making money to support their families? The pass law was eventually scrapped in 1986 but commemorated as a national holiday on August 9, 1995. National Women's Day highlights significant issues facing South African women, such as domestic violence, parenting, unequal pay, sexual harassment in workplaces, girl-child education, and other issues. The South African Women's Day theme for 2024 is celebrate, celebrating 30 years of democracy towards women's development. So to my sisters in South Africa, I want to say, Amandla, our way to the power is yours. And I wear this in honor of your day. The most radical thing that happened in the Kafir boy is love. And I'll, say, and I'll put it this way, the most radical act of defiance in this book is love. The darkness of hate departs 
when the lamp of love is lit and dreams find ways to blossom. I encourage everyone to read The Kafir Boy. This book may have been written almost 40 years ago, but it is so significant in trying to understand the struggles of the people of South Africa, how children were exposed to violence at such a tender age. This book was so important after Mark Matabani published it that Bill Clinton invited him to the White House when he was president. Of course, when Oprah Winfrey read it, she invited him on the show to help people understand what it was for a child to see his parents being thrown up and down like rag dolls and knowing that these are the people they look up to. And then the same set of parents at once, when the men, when the white men, the police are knocking at the door, are hiding in cupboards. There is, there is a place here where Mark's mother, Magdalene, was hidden inside the cupboard and then nobody knew where the key was. She almost suffocated. It was just at the last minute, after some hours, that the young boy at seven found the key and let his mother out of the cupboard. So you can imagine the, the mental torture, the trauma that the children went through under apartheid South Africa. May we never, ever see days like this again. So I send out all my love to the women of South Africa. We recognize and we give you your flowers for all the amazing work that you have done and you'll continue to do for our children in South Africa and for the continent at large. So it's been an interesting moment. I want to tell you that the language in this book is really simple and um, it's an easy read. It took me a day to read it, well, a day and a half because I just could not put it down. And then I want to recognize all the books that I have in my shelf from South Africa. Tom Sharp, Nadine Godima, and of course, the rabble rouser for peace himself, Desmond Tutu. So it's all about South Africa for me this week. So when we come back, I'm going to introduce you to that exceptionally handsome young gentleman who is protesting in a different way. See you after the break. <laughs>